So I'm, I'm letting out baits one at a time. I'm starting to kind of slow how I release them because I don't really have that much bait left in the bin. All of a sudden, I see what looks like a bonita. And I say to the guys, hey, looks like there's a bonita down there. Big old bonita just came by. And then I'm looking at that bonita. I'm like, man, that's quite a big bonita. And he's swimming around, I can see him. He's just chomping the baits one by one, getting closer, he's coming in hot. And then I look, that's no bonita. That's a blackfin tuna. Oh my gosh. And I struggled with, should I tell the guys it was a blackfin or not? But being a good teammate, I told them it was a blackfin so that they could be prepared just in case that they would have a shot in on it and they would take it seriously because I just told them that that was a bonita. Could be a blackfin. And it wasn't a bonita. It was a big old blackfin tuna. Yep. It could have been a blackfin. So I'm watching this blackfin tuna scoop up our baits one by one. And I noticed that there's just one bait left in the water. And I think to myself, where is that fish going to go next? Blackfin tuna are extremely fast fish. There's no way you're just going to drop down and swim up to it and shoot it. The only way to shoot a fish like that is to predict where they're going to be. And that's going to be with the bait. And to be honest with you, I had never shot a blackfin tuna before. So I only knew that from watching YouTube videos. I only knew that from hearing what people say about it. And so I pretty much implemented what I had learned online to that situation and decided to drop down quietly, line up on that last piece of bait and just hope that that fish was gonna come close enough to that bait. He had already felt comfortable with the situation enough. His belly was like probably three quarters full with all the pilchards he had there that he was eating from us. They were all delicious morsels and he wanted to get another bite. So I dove down, lined up on that last piece of bait and just waited. And sure enough, wouldn't you know, that fish came all the way up from the bottom, just started making a beeline right for that bait. It was going so fast. And wouldn't you know, I nailed him in the tail. He said, it's huge. And went back down and I started swimming after that fish as fast as I could, trying to close the gap so that it would take just a little bit less line, not knowing how far that fish was going to run. Because I knew I didn't have a vital shot in that fish and I didn't know how good that shot was. So I wanted to make sure I didn't put too much pressure on that fish. I wanted to make sure that I closed the gap as much as possible. I've had it before when I was rod and reel fishing that you come all the way down to a couple of wraps on the reel. And so every single little thing that you do to gain line on a fish like that is beneficial sometimes in the end. How well's the shot? Does it need another? It's in the tail. I'll nail him again. Yeah, if you can, nail him. So Morgan's driving the boat. Killian makes a beeline to get up on the boat and start chasing after us. Chris Plotter and I started chasing that fish to gain as much line back as possible. And we weren't gaining anything. That fish was just taking off. Hey, can you start pulling him down? Can you start shot? You can pull out of him? He's just going. You gotta let him go. You wanna pull out a little bit? Maybe he'll turn. There's a lot of line out, bro. A lot of line. Fortunately, I had been prepared for that situation in every aspect. I had a belt reel. I hooked that belt reel in the back of the gun. So I now had two reels worth of line that that fish could have taken before we got spooled. He's kicking hard. He's huge. How big is he? He's 30 pounds. And it was a big fish. It was a big black fin tuna. I've caught some black fin tuna like that on rod and reel, but I'd never shot one before. And it was just amazing the kind of power that that fish had peeling out line. So 
So I'm not sure how far we swam after that fish, but it was miles. I mean, we just kept swimming and swimming and swimming. And like I said, I didn't know how good of a hold that shot was. So I wasn't gonna start putting pressure on that fish. And I just wanted that fish to tire out. And I was just going to wait till it did. And then I was gonna gently pull it in and just make sure it had enough line to do what it needed to do. Hopefully those sharks were gonna come up and nail it. But you know, a fish like that swims so fast and far that uh, you know, hopefully it wasn't gonna attract any sharks. But you know, I didn't really know. All I knew was is I really did not want that fish to rip off that spear. <laughs> So at one point in time, so much line has been taken off that reel, and that was a gun that I bought that was spooled up previously, and I actually never even took all the line off, there was so much line, to look and see how it was tied. So the thought had crossed my mind, what if that string wasn't tied properly? I don't want to rip it out. and I start to see the tag end of the line that kind of looks frayed out and doesn't look like it should if somebody took the time to actually tie it properly. And I thought to myself, what if the line isn't even attached to the reel? Oh shit. So I made a loop knot in the shooting line above the whole gun and the reel. And my plan was is that I was going to hook up the belt reel to that line to just bypass the reel altogether. So just as I hook up my belt reel to the shooting line to bypass the reel, all of a sudden I feel that fish slack off and I think that I've got an opportunity to start pulling some line in on it. And then shortly thereafter, that fish must have tired out because I could just feel that it gave up and I just started pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And then I could start to see the fish coming up and that fish just came up foot by foot by foot. And I can't even explain to you the feeling when I knew in my head that I had that fish. No sharks were gonna get it, that I obviously had a good enough shot to hold that fish. And I put my hands around that fish. Chris comes in with the knife, takes it out quick and we had our catch. We had the biggest blackfin tuna. I literally have honestly even seen underwater, let alone shoot. And I have caught a couple a little bit bigger than that on rod and reel, but it's definitely a lot more difficult to shoot one and get close to one because when you're fishing rod and reel, I mean, your lines are like way back. You're using like fluorocarbon leaders, small hooks. You're trying to get as far away from that fish as possible to not spook it. You know, in this situation, you're trying to trick that fish to get as close to you as possible, and we had succeeded. Oh, shit! Kill it! and I just aimed right there, it came right at it, boom! So we started the day off with an epic battle with a Wahoo and succeeded with that. We finished the day off with a beautiful blackfin tuna on just an amazing, amazing weather day. 
and we decided to call it quits after that and head to the island. So we couldn't have been more happy with that experience of the whole day and just the feeling of that trip to start the first day off like that was just incredible. <laughs> so this isn't my first tuna, but it's my first tuna on spear. So here it goes. Better right the heart. Mm. Okay, stop filming so I can spit it out. So we checked in to the island, we set up camp. What's what's going on over there? <laughs> you look like a you're like a trapped in a bug trap. Oh my god. We thought that the weather was gonna be like that the entire time that we were just going to be hitting it hard like that every single day. But unfortunately, and fortunately, that was the best weather day that we had. So I'm really happy that we took advantage of that as much as we could, because those were the biggest fish that we had the entire trip. Those were the most amazing moments that we had, and we hadn't even arrived to the island yet. So we were super stoked to have those fish in the cooler and, uh, and to be eaten like kings and queens. So throughout the trip, we shot a number of fish, number of muttons, number of trigger fish, number of Yellow Jacks, you just, you name it. Release. It came right up to my face. I mean, anything that was good and decent of size, we were putting a shot in. I remember one time that uh, Killian went down, shot a nice black grouper. Oh, 
it up for the camera. For the gram. Doing it for the gram. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Grab, 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 grab. <laughs> Remember another time that Plotter went down and shot a nice red grouper right between the eyes. And it was a great trip. And it was actually a trip that we wrote about in an article for Spearing Magazine. Oh, I should have brought the magazine. You should check out that magazine. Chris Plotter wrote a really nice article. And a lot of great photography by myself and Killian. And, uh, you know, it's just a really cool article to read. And it's going to be a totally different perspective than these films. So, you know, I edited a film about this dry tortuga's trip a while ago. It's been on my channel for quite a while, and it was the about the blackfin tuna, but I never actually even did anything with the, the wahoo that Killian and I teamed up on because I didn't have the time. And so that's been one that's sitting in the archives for quite a while that I've wanted to spend the time on, but it was a lot harder to do because there's multiple camera angles, whatnot, and I really wanted to tell the story. So uh, that part of the story hasn't been yet released on the channel. So at one point in time, we were driving along, we saw some fish busting. We drive over there, we're thinking there's gonna be some tuna. I jump in first, everybody's gearing up. I think it was first thing in the morning. I make a dive down, I see some tuna. I'm making that dive down, and I see out of the corner of my eye, some dolphins start swimming right up to me. And I'm like, trying to make a decision. Check out the dolphin, or go down for the tuna. I'm like, ah, and I chose the dolphin, because it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen, is those dolphins just swimming up to me in like 70 something foot of water, just totally in their environment. I felt like one of them. I felt like I belonged there or something. It's a really weird feeling to be down so deep and just doing your thing down there and just to look over and be like, hey, hanging out with these, these aquatic mammals. That was a really cool experience and one of the highlights of, of the trip. That was awesome, bro. Dove down with some big ass banana and dolphins ran through. Sick. So we got back to the island and it was time to make some dinner. So we decided not to dig out the wahoo and the blackfin tuna because we had it packed real nice with ice. We had some really big muttons that we decided to clean. And I cleaned the fish and we fired up the grill and had some really cool dinner. We had made some new friends and just had a good time camping out right there on the island. And the cool thing about dry tortugas is it's so far out there that you have no lights that you can basically see the Milky Way. So I was out there, Killian and I were taking some really epic shots at night. I didn't really film a whole lot of the island like maybe I should have, but uh, we took some really cool pics of the Milky Way and of light painting, and it was a really good time. Camping on an island like that was probably the most epic location I've ever camped in in my entire life. And I definitely plan on going back there. I definitely plan on spending a lot more time there on the island. I didn't even actually get to spend any time going through the structure because we were getting up early in the morning to go spear, and then we were coming back late at night. And once it gets dark, you can't even be there. So going to have to save that for another trip. We'll make a video on that one next time. Ooh, it looks sexy as shit. Oh, yeah, look at these triggers. Okay, guys, after we take this picture, I'm going to measure that fish, and you got to be my witnesses. Okay. Judah Clark got a black fin tuna entry, 32 and a half inches. Killian is my witness. Seen it. Chris and Morgan. Look at that catch. Yeah. So when I got back home, that was time to clean those fish. Tonight we'll be having blackfin tuna as an appetizer and seared wahoo as the main course. How do you feel about that? So the first dinner that I had when I got back was some seared blackfin tuna and wahoo, and that was absolutely amazing. I do make a really mean blackfin tuna tataki. But I gotta be honest with you, I really like the Wahoo Tataki a lot better. So, Kimber got some of that. You remember that? Last piece of blackfin tuna. Are you hungry, Kimber? We 
we need to figure out how to catch more of those wahoo because splitting it amongst everybody, you don't get as much as you think. So that wahoo ended up being just shy of 30 pounds. A respectable fish for sure, especially for your first fish ever on your trip. And that blackfin tuna was just about 30 pounds as well and couldn't have been happier with that catch. So I was really happy to have shared that experience with both Killian and Plauner. And that's one of the reasons why they are my two of my favorite best buds when it comes to spearing. It's because the experiences that we've had together, the moments that we've shared, and I'm really looking forward to doing more trips with these guys in the future. So thanks for watching another episode of the Fishing Adventures of Judah and Kimber Clark. And stay tuned for more epic adventures every single day. Right? It's a lot of work doing this every day, right? I didn't even really realize how much work it was going to be. But it's a lot of work. Not for you, you don't have to do shit. Except for look pretty. <laughs> <laughs>